It is uh, lovely to be here with you this morning. We lost track of time, we've got there too much conversation around the cars, but it's good to be able to see you and talk with you and catch up and see how everyone's doing. Uh, it is going to be dry. I'm determined about that, um, that it will be dry, and if it does rain, we'll just pretend it's not raining. Um, that's how determined I am, that we will stay here and we will worship together uh, on this wonderful Sunday morning. Uh, we, we are back from a, a, a lovely break that we've had. Uh, we went away for a week, uh, and uh, it was nice just to stop uh, and take things easy for a while. Uh, I was telling somebody yesterday proof of, of how little we did as I managed to finish three books uh, during the week. So uh, a lot of doing nothing, and it was just what we needed. But um, it is lovely to be back and to be able to worship with our church family together this morning. If you are watching us online, it is lovely to have you with us too. Uh, and we do hope and pray that this time of worship will be meaningful to you in your home as much as it is here in our church car park uh, today. We're here this morning to worship God. So let us be still and let us come into the presence of our God. Heavenly Father, we come to worship you on this Sunday morning where the clouds are gathering above us, but we are surrounded by your Spirit. And as your Spirit moves through this car park, as it moves into the homes of those who are watching us this morning, into other church communities, wherever they are gathered and in whatever way they are gathered, loving God, our prayer this morning is that we will sense a movement of your Spirit, not just around us, but within us. That your Spirit will stir us in a way that will draw us closer to you, that will stir up within us an understanding of who we are in your eyes, that we are the beloved children of God, and you love us as we are. And God, we praise you for that, because in this world there are so many um, things that we have to live up to before we are accepted and loved by others, but you love us just as we are. And we give you praise and thanks for that. Loving God, as we gather in this way for worship today, we pray that you will be blessed by our worship. That when we sing in our cars or, or standing up front, when we sing in our homes, or just sing silently along in our hearts and in our minds, loving God, you will be pleased with what you hear because it won't be our voices that you hear but the worship of our hearts and the worship of our lives. And so, God, may this time be a blessing for you as much as it is a blessing for us. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. If you do want to brave the weather, there are some chairs out front here. If you want to come and sit and join in uh, in that way, otherwise you're welcome to stay uh, in your car. As I said, it is not going to rain, so don't be afraid of the rain. Uh, do come along and grab a chair and join with us up front here. I'm going to invite uh, Bianca uh, and Joanne to come and lead us in our opening song, uh, which is on the hymn sheets that you have been given. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father.
Thank you very much, Bianca and Joanne. Uh, and I do hope that you sang along uh, during the, the worship there. And thank you, Ruth, uh, for, for playing and for braving the weather because Ruth, like me, is determined that it's not going to rain um, today. Or, or at least during the service. It can rain later all at once. Just a few announcements, uh, a few things that are happening to let you know of, of, of what is happening in the weeks ahead and also what has happened uh, in the weeks gone past. Uh, first of all, to remind you that uh, we continue with our weekly prayer meeting on a Tuesday night on Zoom. Uh, you are all welcome to be a part of that. All we need is an email address. Uh, we can send you the link uh, and you can join along uh, in that prayer meeting on Zoom. Uh, that's Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock. Uh, during the month of August, we're just taking a break from the Bible studies as we would normally do during the summer. <coughs> And then uh, on Thursdays at 12 o'clock, there will be our weekly reflection that comes up onto YouTube. And I'll share that link across WhatsApp and Facebook as well. Next Sunday is an online service. Uh, it is also the service in Machrefelt. Being the second week of the month during this lockdown period, that has become our uh, communion Sunday. So we will have online Holy Communion next Sunday. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do something different, is we're going to have Holy Communion in the Machrefelt service. Uh, so we will set things up for the folk in Machrefelt to take Holy Communion uh, in a safe way. Uh, but we will also then have that service on Facebook Live so you can join with us uh, in Holy Communion. The service starts at 10 o'clock and we will have the communion part towards the beginning of the service. So if you join us on Facebook Live from 10 o'clock, you can join in with uh, that part of the Macrofelt service. Uh, and then at 11 o'clock uh, on YouTube, there will be an online service broadcast as we um, usually do, uh, and, and along with a Facebook watch party. So next Sunday, Holy Communion uh, from around 10 o'clock on Facebook Live coming from the Macrofelt uh, Sunday morning service and then the online service at 11 o'clock. And then we will meet again in two weeks for a service here in our church car park. And we will start conversations amongst the leadership in the next week or so around uh, are we going to move back into our churches and what is that going to look like? Uh, so those conversations will begin and we will inform you as those decisions get made about when we are going to go back into our church building and what that's going to look like. So those are the things that are happening uh, in the weeks ahead. What we have missed in the weeks that have gone by, and, and this one went a bit under the radar, and maybe that's because he's not that much on social media, if at all, uh, is that Winston has had a birthday since last we were together here. Um, and so we want to wish Winston a happy birthday. You, you can hide under your, your jacket, Winston. Nobody can see you anyway <laughs> in the car. <laughs> but we want to wish Winston uh, a very happy birthday. Oh, oh, wait, yeah, he's away. <laughs> Uh, have, having been away for the last couple of weeks, I'm not aware of any other birthday celebrations that have happened. If there's anybody here that has, if you want to wave and, and we can wish you a happy birthday, but I, I, I don't see um, anybody, nobody even indicating somebody else. So, so Winston, a very happy birthday from your church family. We hope it was a, a wonderful day that you had. As much as we celebrate together as a church family, we also grieve together as a church family. And it is with sadness that I must share with you that Larry Ferguson's brother passed away on Friday. Uh, and as, as we know, these are very difficult times to lose a loved one because we don't know how uh, we're supposed to grieve uh, in, in ways that, that are unusual to us. But as a church family, our prayers and our thoughts go out to Larry uh, and to his family. Uh, in, in their time of loss and grief at this time. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Loving God, we lift up to you the Fergusons. We lift up to you all, Lord, who grieve in this time, all who have lost loved ones. We pray that your compassion and your strength will surround them, that in their times of sadness, as they remember the ones that they love so much that they have lost, Loving God, we pray that they will just feel your arms around them. Loving God, we thank you that you are a God of compassion, that you are a God who understands what it feels like to lose a loved one. And our reading today speaks into that. 
And so, God, we know that as we grieve and as our hearts break for the loss of loved ones, your heart breaks too. And so, God, we pray that today and tomorrow for the funeral service, that Lowry and his family will just know your love, will know your strength and know your compassion. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to turn to our reading today. Uh, the, the reading is on the, uh, on, the, on the hymn sheet that I handed out. It's the NIV version, but if you have your own Bibles, you're welcome to follow along uh, in your Bible. The reading comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. It is a familiar passage. Um, it is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. We pick it up at verse 13. When Jesus heard what had happened, and what had happened was he had heard the news of the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by a boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed those who were ill. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away, so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he told the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. And we end our reading there and we thank God for his word. Let us bow our heads in prayer. <coughs> Loving God, we thank you for this message, this, this passage of scripture that has been given to us. That it has been passed on from generation to generation, allowing us to read it and allowing it to read us in this time and in this place. Your word is a living word. And so it is not just an historical record of an event that happened nearly 2,000 years ago, but is it, a it is a word that speaks to each one of us in this day and in this place. And so God, we pray that we will allow you to do that, that we will allow you to speak to us today, that our hearts and our minds will be open to this message, and that anything that creates or forms a barrier between you and us, Lord, that you will just remove that. Forgive us our sin, because our sin is sometimes the cause of that barrier. Lord, whatever sins we have committed in this past week that have created a, a space between you and us, Lord, that, that, that prevents us from hearing your word and from drawing close to you, loving God, we confess that sin to you now. And we ask your forgiveness. And we celebrate in the good news of the gospel that says that our sins are forgiven if we confess them to you. And so God, now that we are in communion with you, we pray that you will speak gently into our hearts today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. What we're looking at today is a very familiar story to us, the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's an incredible story. Jesus takes five loaves and two fishes, he blesses it, he gives thanks to God, and then he tells his disciples to distribute it amongst 5,000 men plus whatever women and children were gathered there. And there is not just enough to feed everybody, but there is more than enough. And at the end of it all, he ends up with more than what they started with. Just an incredible story. What I don't want to do today is to get caught up in 
how did he do it? Because that's, that, that comes with the presumption, uh, the assumption, and, and, and um, you know, the thought that, that whatever God does can be explained in human terms, or needs to be explained in human terms. What we're seeing here is an incredible miracle of provision from the God who loves and provides. What I want to do today is ask the question, why? And there are several why questions that pop up in the story. The obvious first question would be, well, why does Jesus do this? Why does Jesus, who, who, is, who has gone off to be on his own because, because he is grieving, he, his cousin, somebody he knows well, somebody he loves, has, has been executed, and Jesus just wants to go off and be alone. He wants time for himself. And, and we can understand that when we have lost loved ones, sometimes we just need to be on our own and just reflect and think about everything that has happened. And so Jesus does it, but when people hear that Jesus has gone off somewhere, they go and they, they go to where he is or, or, or perhaps there's a, the, the, there's a, a sense here that, that they've arrived ahead of him because they know where he's going. And, uh, and Jesus doesn't chase them away. Jesus doesn't say, yeah, I just want to be alone. Because I'm, I'm sure if he explained that to people, people would probably understand that he just wants to be on his own. But no, Jesus looks at them and he stops his own time to spend with that. The question, why does Jesus do that? Well, well, that's a simple question to ask and it's a simple question to answer because verse 14 tells us exactly why. It says that Jesus looks at them and he has compassion on them. Jesus is love. God is love. That's what the scriptures tell us. And, and we know that God's way of expressing his love is through sacrifice. And so it makes perfect sense to us that Jesus would sacrifice his own time and his own needs for the needs of these people. That, that in, in Mark's version of this passage tells us that Jesus looks at them and not only is he full with compassion, but he, he looks at them and he sees them uh, as, as being like sheep without a shepherd. And, and God knows, uh, Jesus knows that these people are desperate for something. But that's not the why question I want to ask first. I don't want to ask the why question of why does Jesus do this? Because the answer is there in verse 14. What I want to ask is, why do the people go to Jesus when they need healing? Why do people, the people go to Jesus when they are looking for something, when they have a need? Because there, there, there are other, during this time, there are other healers traveling around Israel. There are other people who are claiming to have miraculous powers or, or, or supernatural powers that can bring healing. But why do the people go to Jesus? And the answer to that question must be because they've heard about him. And they've heard what he can do. We, we find that at the beginning of Mark's Gospel. It says in, in, in Mark 1 verse 28, it says, News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. So people knew about Jesus. They heard what he could do. They heard that he brings healing and wholeness and restoration into the lives of people. And so they go to him. And that reminds me of what Paul writes in Romans 10. He says this, and this is the message version, because I think that it's written so beautifully. How can people call for help if they don't know who to trust? And how can they know who to trust if they haven't heard of the one who can be trusted? And how can they hear if nobody tells them? Before you trust, you have to listen. But unless Christ's word is preached, there is nothing to listen to. This passage of scripture just screams evangelism it screams the people of God talking about about God the people knew that they could go to Jesus because they had heard about Jesus and the reason that they had heard about Jesus is because people were speaking about Jesus we have a world out there I'm trying to work that out 50 yards behind me of lost sheep looking for a shepherd of people in desperate need of somebody to heal them. Whatever it is in their life that needs healing, whether that is physical, mental, spiritual, emotional healing, they need to know where they can find a good shepherd. And the only way that they can know is if they hear about him. 
And the only way that they will hear about who Jesus is and what Jesus can do is if the people of God speak about Jesus. This passage tells me that the reason that people were looking to Jesus for healing is because the, those who had encountered Jesus and those who knew Jesus and had experienced Jesus were talking about Jesus. If we look at the world around us and we see a broken world that is in need of Jesus, we have a responsibility to make that broken world aware of Jesus by talking about him. So that's the first why question. Why did the people go to Jesus? It's because they knew that Jesus was the answer to all the questions they were asking in their life. And they knew because people had spoken about Jesus and shared about Jesus. The second why question, there's only two, if you worry that I've got a whole list of loads and loads of why questions. The second why question is this, why does Jesus, if Jesus knows what he's going to do, and, and I have no doubt that Jesus knew that he was going to perform a miracle here, and he was going to feed 5,000 men plus women and children from five loaves and two fishes, if he knew what he was going to do, why does he say to his disciples in verse 16, they do not need to go away you give them something to eat. If Jesus knows that he's going to feed them. Why does he tell his disciples, you need to feed them? And I can think of three reasons why Jesus does this. The first reason is this. As followers of Jesus, he wants them to be aware that they can't pass their responsibility onto somebody else. They, the disciples' plan was, let's send these people into the town and let's let the market sellers and the shopkeepers and the bakers and whoever else is in the town, let them take on the responsibility of feeding these people. But Jesus says, no, we're not going to pass that responsibility on everybody else. As a follower of Jesus, it is our responsibility to look at a broken world around us, to see the needs of this broken world around us and to meet those needs. To meet people at their point of need. If we're going to witness Jesus' love, then we need to show Jesus' love. We can't just witness it in words. We can't just say to people, Jesus loves you. And I know this because the Bible tells me. We need to say to people, Jesus loves you and we're going to show you the love of Jesus. And that's the first reason that I think, that I believe, that Jesus says to his disciples, you feed them. We're not going to pass the buck here. We're not going to say it's somebody else's responsibility. As a disciple of Jesus, Jesus is saying it's your responsibility. These people are like lost sheep in need of a shepherd. And I am the good shepherd. And as my followers, you are going to do the work of the good shepherd. And you are going to feed these people. The second reason that I believe that Jesus says you feed them is this. Jesus says to them, you feed them. And, and they go off to find what there is. And all they can find is five loaves and two fishes. And they must have looked at what they had and thought, this is not nearly enough. And how often don't we look around at what we have and go, we don't have enough here to do the work that God wants us to do. And maybe that's as individuals and maybe that's as a church community. And we think we don't have enough. And what Jesus is saying to these disciples is, you might not think you have enough, but you do. You have plenty here. In fact, you have more than enough, because once we've fed these people, you're going to have plenty left over. It reminds me of, of back in February, it seems like such a long time ago, when things were normal and we could actually meet in buildings together. But we had a meeting back in February, some of the leaders with our district superintendent, Stephen Skoos, and, and we did a little exercise. We were thinking about what do we do next as a church in the life of our church? Um, how do we minister into, um, into our church family, but how do we minister into the community around us? And, and part of that thinking and conversation involved a little exercise that's called a, a SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T, and it stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. And we looked at what are the strengths of our church family um, and our church community, what are the weaknesses within there, what are the opportunities that we have to minister, what are the threats to our ministry. And once we had drawn up a list of strengths and weaknesses, 
He said something very important, very significant, something that stuck with me. Too often we look at our weaknesses and we say we need to work on these things. And he said, no, look at your strengths. Look at what you do have. Don't look at what you don't have. Look at what you do have. And this is what Jesus is saying to his disciples here. Look at what you do have. You've got five loaves and two fishes. And you know what? That might not seem like enough to you, but it's more than enough to me. Let's not get caught up on the things that we don't have and the things that we can't do and the skills that are lacking. Let us look at who we are and what skills and gifts and talents we have, what resources God has given to us. And let's be aware that that is not just enough, but it is more than enough for the work that God wants to do. Yes, we would love to have more people in our church. Yes, we would love to see our church family grow and grow and grow. But let's not for one moment think that we do not already have enough in our church, in our church families, whether that is here in Cookstown or whether that is in Macrofelt, that we do not have enough already to do the work that God wants us to do. And then the third reason that I believe that Jesus says to them, you are going to feed them. And this is possibly the most important reason of all. Is that Jesus is saying, we're going to do this together. Jesus could, Jesus could very easily have fed those 5,000 on his own. He could very easily have known, well he did know, that there was a young boy there with a bag of lunch. And Jesus could very easily have called him forward and said, bring those to me, let me bless them. And we're going to spread this out and feed. And God can do anything that God chooses to do on his own. But God's desire is to invite us to be a part of the work that God is doing. Right from the very beginning, when we open Genesis and we see God create this incredible world that we live in. And this incredible universe that is, that is just absolute perfection. Everything is perfectly distanced from everything else. Everything rotates at the perfect speed. Everything is just at the right temperature. There's just the, the, the right amount of water and, and, and the right amount of oxygen and nitrogen in the air for us to breathe. Uh, and everything is just perfect. And, and, and God could just go, wow, that is wonderful. And I'm just going to sit back and watch this incredible creation of mine just exist. But God chooses to bring humanity into this creation and God chooses to work with humanity. He says to the man in the garden, he says, you take care of this creation. And God and humanity work together from the very beginning. But then we choose to go our own way, but it is always God's desire to draw us back and invite us to be a part of what he is doing. And although Jesus could have fed these 5,000 on his own, God chooses to make his disciples a part of the work that he is doing. He says, no, you feed them. And he allows his disciples to go and gather together the resources. He allows his disciples to bring them to him. And then the disciples allow Jesus to do his work. And Jesus performs this incredible miracle and the disciples go and they distribute this incredible bounty that God has created out of such small resources. God can bring change to this world in an instant. But God chooses to invite his church, his people, to be a part of the incredible transformation that he wants to bring. Why does Jesus say that the disciples must feed them and not the shopkeepers in the nearby town? Because these are the people, the followers of Jesus, and he wants them to be a part of his incredible work. Jesus wants to see this world transformed. He wants to see the lost sheep found. And he wants his people, his church, to be a part of the work that he is doing. When I ask why is all this happening, it is because Jesus is a God of love and compassion. It is because Jesus sees the lost sheep of this world and his heart breaks for them. And his desire is to see their needs met and to be fed. And why does Jesus say to his disciples, you feed them? It's because Jesus wants us to be a part of that incredible experience of bringing transformation into the individual lives of people and into entire communities. 
all we see is a broken world and what God sees is lost sheep looking for a shepherd and he knows that he has got some found sheep who have incredible stories to tell who, who can tell people about the amazing things that Jesus has done in their lives and and you know what sometimes those amazing stories as we think about them they're probably not that amazing at all but when we really think about them they are just incredible when we think about how we have had strength to carry on when the most terrible things have happened to us when we have lost loved ones and yet we have found the strength to carry on when we have looked at our bank accounts and seen nothing there and, and we don't know where the next meal is going to come from. And God has provided. When we have been concerned and stressed about employment and where we're going to get a job from. And yet, yeah, we still are. And we're okay. And God has carried us through this. And there are people out there today who don't know that there is a God who is going to give them the strength when a loved one is lost. That when their jobs are lost, that are going to carry them through. That there are the people of God who are going to come and surround them and bring them a bag of groceries and leave it on their front door or slip an envelope through their front door and they will never know where it comes from. But God has used His people because they have faithfully responded to God's invitation to feed. You feed these people. You meet their need. God is inviting us in this time of coronavirus to be a witness to God's love to reach out to the lost to the lonely to the broken-hearted to the hungry and our response cannot be send them there and let them go get food there send them to that place we've done that too long as a church and I'm not talking about this specific church I'm talking about the church with a capital C for too long we've allowed others to do the work of God it is us we are the people of God we are called to do the work of God and so when you go home when you go shopping when you go back to work whatever it is that you're going to be doing this week and you look around and you see brokenness and you see hunger hear God's voice say to you you feed them you and me we need to feed them let us pray. Loving God, we were hungry and you fed us. We were naked and you clothed us. We were in prison, in, in the chains of sin and you set us free. We have stories to tell about you. Help us, God, to be aware and to be reminded of those stories so that we can share them with others so that this broken world that we live in can know that Jesus loves them and he wants so desperately for them to be found loving God a lost sheep can wander around never knowing that it's lost you can simply think that it is free until the wolves come to devour it Loving God, there are so many lost people in this world who don't know that they're lost. But when they discover that they are, and they need a shepherd to lead them, our prayer, God, is that they will know that you are the good shepherd. But God, I think of those words that, that Paul writes to the Romans. Before you trust, you have to listen. But unless Christ's word is preached, there is nothing to listen to. Before they can trust in you, they need to know about you. But how will they know about you if we don't tell them? Give us the strength and the courage to share Jesus with others. Loving God, we pray for this broken world. And we pray for the hurting and the hungry. And God, in our own church family, we, there are people that we want to pray for. That we want to lift up to you in their time of struggle and their time of difficulty. Perhaps it is difficulty because of illness. Perhaps it is difficulty because of medical conditions. Because it is concern about finances. 
because it is concerned about unemployment, uh, mental health issues. Perhaps there is concern about going back to school and what that's going to look like. Loving God, we want to lift our church family up to you. And we want to pray for them, God. And we want to pray that even right now, they will be reassured and comforted by your presence. And by the reassurance that you are in control of all things. That whatever their concerns are, whatever their needs are, whatever it is that they are hungry for, that they will be reassured that the God who loves them is the God who meets them at their point of need. Loving God, we want to pray for for Alan Keyes, we lift him up to you, Lord. Just in hospital today, having some tests done, we pray that you will bring healing and wholeness to him, Lord. We think of Fred, the organist in Macrofeld, loving God, in hospital at the moment, waiting surgery tomorrow. May the surgery be a success, Lord, and may he be back to his usual self. Heaven help us, but may he be back to his usual self sooner rather than later. He is such a faithful servant. We pray, Lord, for Anne McConnell and the wider McConnell family, Lord. We lift them up to you and we pray that you will bring them healing and you will give them courage and strength, Lord, in this time. We have prayed earlier for Lowry and his family and we continue to pray for them, Lord, that in this time of grief they will know comfort. But for others, Lord, in our church family who have known loss during this lockdown period, who have had anniversaries of loved ones that they have lost during this lockdown period, Lord, where they would love to come together with family and just be with each other, but restrictions have prevented that. We pray your comfort for them too, Lord. For those, Lord, who have been uh, restricted for the last, goodness knows how many months now, have not been able to leave their homes, but now that has changed. Loving God, we give you thanks for that and we pray your continued protection over them. That they will not be anxious, but rather will know that you watch over them. And help us as a wider society to be aware of that. And to be filled with the same compassion that Jesus has. And not to think that I'm not going to wear a mask because, hey, it's an infringement on my freedom and my rights. But to recognize that by wearing a mask, we are making others feel more comfortable about coming out of their homes and more secure about coming out of, their, out of their homes. And then, God, I pray for our leadership, our leadership here in our church and in our country. We pray that you will give them wisdom and understanding and that they will look to you for guidance. Let us not get caught up and I think of our leaders in our country at the moment Lord let us not be caught up in petty arguments and petty differences there are important issues that need to be dealt with may our leaders overcome these differences and focus on the important issues and then God I pray for this broken world wherever there is brokenness in this world Lord and it comes in many different forms. It is not just through this COVID-19 pandemic. But there is a lot of brokenness. There is poverty. There is famine. There is flooding. There is violence. There is abuse. There is exploitation. So much brokenness, Lord. We pray that in each of these places where there is brokenness, you will raise up people to speak the truth of Jesus. And that people will come to you in droves, seeking healing and strength and restoration. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. And we say together now the prayer that Jesus gave us in our cars and in our homes. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to invite 
Bianca and Joanne up again uh, to sing our closing hymn. The last time we sang this, it was pouring with rain. We couldn't hear the sound and we had to abandon the song. Uh, but the sun is shining on us. And, and I mean that in more than just that sun, that big ball of fire in the sky. But, but God is shining his light on us today. And so we're going to sing what a friend we have in Jesus. This, this Jesus who is compassionate and caring and kind and loving. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. So that brings us to the end of our service. I remind you that you can join with us on Tuesday evening for our prayer meeting uh, and also next week Sunday online. So just to remind you again that the Holy Communion will be on Facebook Live from around 10 o'clock. It will be in the first part of the service in Machtefeld and then there will be an online service from 11 o'clock on YouTube. I just want to say thank you to, to everybody that has helped with getting things set up this morning. Rachel on the on the project uh, uh, on the um, camera. Um, Ivor, thank you for uh, for bringing your van as a backup just in case um, and for helping set things up. And also to to Michael and to Winston uh, for your help in setting things up. And to to Ruth again for for playing for us. Uh, and Joanne and Bianca. And I think that's everyone. Um, and if I have forgotten anybody else, my deepest apologies. But thank you to you as well for coming along and joining with us here in the car park. For you at home, for, for joining us online. Uh, and, and also if you're watching this later as well, um, for taking the time to, to hear God's word speak to us. It has been wonderful uh, to be able to share with you again uh, today. And I do look forward um, to, to doing that again in two weeks, but also really look forward to, to sometime, hopefully in, in the not too distant future, doing that there um, together with you 
um, inside that building. But I do remind you uh, to, to just be cautious in everything that you do, to keep yourself safe, keep others safe as well. Um, this virus has not gone away. Um, there is no vaccine, so we need to be sure um, and we need to be safe. Um, so, so please, please do that. We're going to say the grace together um, as, as we sit in our cars and as we sit in our homes. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all on this day and forevermore. And all God's people blew their hooters together. Folks, have a wonderful, wonderful week and do stay safe.